Hello, welcome back to our APT webinars. I hope all of you are enjoying the new year and uh, found some time to relax and take care of yourself over the holidays. Uh, we'll be doing the webinar up until about 2.45 today and uh, after that uh, I'll open our conversation to um, answering questions. So if you notice um, over at your control panel, there is a place where you can type in questions. And as you um, type in questions, uh, you know, I, it, it'll show up on my screen and it'll be there uh, when it's time for the question answer uh, moment. And I, I just noticed that um, my dear friend and colleague, Laura, said hello to me. And so I, I want to take this moment and thank her for participating in our last webinar, which was our first interactive webinar. And just so all of you know, that webinar was edited today and should be posted on the website. Uh, in fact, all of our webinar, webinars ought to be posted on the website um, by the end of today. So if you haven't seen the webinar before, then, um, you know, just go to the www.affectphobia therapy page and uh, look under uh, certified APT webinars and all of them will be posted there for you. So, uh, so uh, let's see here. I, let's continue. And um, as you notice, we will be um, working on um, defenses today. And just so all of you know, we're going to be working on defense recognition, which is a part of defense restructuring. Our next webinar, which will be taking place in March, will be focusing in on defense relinquishing. And, uh, and so, but for today, we'll focus on recognition. And uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Kristen Osborne. I've been a part of the APT community since 2003. And I recently had a book published called Paraverbal Communication Psychotherapy Beyond the Words. And I, I strongly recommend it if you want to get a sense of me and my background and how I work. I'm really looking forward to joining some of you in um, Sweden in February where we're going to have a workshop called um, Listen With Your Eyes. And it'll be a chance for people to really get a sense of uh, the book that was just published and the type of research that we do here in Boston. Uh, for our upcoming a APT training events, we have a core training um, that's going to be starting in uh, June in Boston. And if you're interested in coming out to Boston and being a part of the core training, we would really love to have you. And uh, our next webinar I mentioned was in March, and there's also uh, a, a very interesting new workshop that will be taking place in Norway called um, Transgenerational Affectphobia, where we actually look at how affectphobias are handed down from generation to generation and have video of um, work with adolescents and families. And uh, for the first time ever, we're going to have an advanced APT training in April in London. And that's just a really great opportunity for you to bring your videos and um, to be able to show them within a group and receive feedback. Uh, you know, uh, other things that are kind of in the works right now but haven't been uh, published is there's a possibility that um, we'll be doing a small workshop in Lisbon, Portugal in February. And then uh, an afternoon workshop in San Francisco on, uh, 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 in March, I think March 18th. And so as soon as I find out about those events, I'll be sure to post it on the website and, of course, let you know at our next uh, webinar. So, so when we start with defense recognition, I want you to just look at these guiding questions. Um, because there are questions that can help you kind of get into your therapist stance and know like what you want to do when working with defenses. And so you want to be focusing on creating a compassionate therapist stance. And we'll talk more about that in the webinar today. And uh, your main goal is to increase your client's awareness of their defenses. You want them to like really be able to start looking at themselves and seeing how they're defending. And everything that we're talking about today is going to help you increase 
your chances of really being able to connect with your clients so that they can see themselves more clearly. Uh, another thing is you want to be helping them cultivate compassion for their defenses. Uh, you know, always keep in mind that defenses come to play typically in childhood and they're there for really important reasons. Um, they, they acted as a way to protect the person that you're working with originally and they've helped your client get, you know, on with their life even if they've had very hard things um, in front of them. Another thing we'll be looking at is um, how to regulate anxieties because when you're working with defenses, people automatically experiencing, experience a lot of shame and pain. And so you're always going to have to be ready to regulate the anxieties that come up. Uh, we'll also be looking at um, validating defenses and pointing out strengths. These are all really important parts of working with defense recognition. By the end of this training, I hope you'll improve your ability to collaborate with your client, to raise your client's awareness of their defenses, to regulate anxiety, and to shift between defense restructuring, affect restructuring, and self and other restructuring. That's a really important piece of working with defenses is that it's, it's truly an art form where you're trying to help someone see their defenses, but when their anxieties come up, you need to be regulating the anxiety. You also need to be keeping in mind uh, what affect that they are avoiding and, uh, and also where they are in terms of like self-restructuring and self-other restructuring. So sometimes you might be working with defenses regulating anxiety while focused on an affect uh, like anger. Other times you might be working with defenses, regulating anxiety, and focusing in on self-compassion. And self-compassion work is a huge part of um, working with defenses because of the shame. You're always going to want to be um, helping your client cultivate more compassion for themselves, more understanding of the origin of their defenses, so that they can be kinder to themselves and, and much more open and available to look at their defenses and to consider letting them go. So for this workshop, I um, studied um, Chapter 5 in the Treating Affect Phobia Manual, and the basics are all in this webinar um, from the manual. But I have to be honest with you, I found that changing character um, really was much more helpful uh, to me uh, when I was developing this webinar because it offers so many more details and um, so many more vivid examples. And so if you have changing character, I strongly recommend that you go to um, that book and look at um, everything that Lee McCullough had to say about defenses because you'll find it very, very helpful in um, learning how to work with defenses. So just for a quick review, uh, um, let's just talk about how APT categorizes defenses. We see defenses as maladaptive feelings, behaviors, and thoughts, but we always keep in mind that, you know, people have erected defenses to kind of support them, to protect them, to keep them safe. And so a lot of defenses have been very supportive in the past and can be supportive uh, in the present and the future. But we're really paying attention to when they get in the way of what your client wants um, to experience in their life or the type of relationships that they want to have. Because typically defenses work until they don't anymore. And that tends to be when people show up in your office. And so we also look at um, symptoms as a way to categorize um, defenses, uh, all access one and access two diagnoses, and we keep in mind that you know any affect can work as a defense, and even inhibitory affects like guilt, shame, uh, emotional pain, anxiety, uh, disgust, they can act as a defense too. And so you know it's probably easier to think that anything can be a defense, any feeling, any behavior, any thought. You just want to be asking yourself like. Is the, um, the behavior, thought, and feeling that I'm seeing, is it helping my client or is it hurting my client? If you come up with um, hurting, then it's a defense. Uh, keep in mind that um, you know defenses uh, were developed in childhood. I know I already mentioned that before, but it's really important for you to consider that because 
when you're doing defense work, you're also doing work on the triangle person. And so it's, it's actually impossible to separate the two. So you want to be very well aware of the fact that their defenses have a long history. And a lot of what your job is is to explore that history and to find out more about the defenses. And, uh, and you do that by asking questions, um, by offering support, by regulating anxiety. And, uh, and so you want to always be in a very open place when you're working and, uh, and, and in a very curious place too. And so, you know, when we are putting defenses on the triangle, it goes in the left-hand pole. And, uh, and so anything that seems off to you or quirky, um, it could be a defense. And so you want to get really good at being able to list the defenses. Uh, in the beginning, all I would ask myself is, is this defense helpful or hurtful, constructive or destructive? And uh, I have to tell you, the person who helped me um, the most um, with learning, uh, you know, the, the motivation behind defenses was Case Cornelson. And um, he has a really good idea, uh, eye for, for defense work. And, um, and so, you know, when you're looking for defenses in a session, you want to always be carefully listening um, watching and uh, paying attention. Um, most importantly, you want to be paying attention to your instincts. You know, what, are you getting any gut feelings? Uh, is there anything that just feels off or feels right on? And um, you also want to be like um, hearing, um, seeing, feeling for anything that seems maladaptive, dysfunctional, hurtful. You're looking for avoidance. Uh, you're looking for anything that doesn't seem um, right. And so when, when things don't add up, then you're typically looking at a defense. Uh, a lot of times I'll paint a picture in my mind with everything that someone's saying and doing, and I'll look in my mind for what's missing. And, uh, and so that, that oftentimes has come in very handy for me to be very visual when, when I'm working. Uh, so, oops. Oh, it looks like my uh, PowerPoint just needs a little prompting for me this way. Okay. So keep in mind that your main job when working with defenses is increasing awareness. You're helping your client be able to see their defenses. You're regulating anxiety. You also want to be pointing out like, oh, look, you know, I, I just uh, paid attention to your defense and now it looks like you're really anxious right now. And so you want to be marrying that to your client too. And you want to always be looking at your client's reaction like together with them. This is a really collaborative process. Uh, it helps to always ask for permission. And permission can look like you just asking like, is it okay if we look at your defense together? Are you all right with that? Are you ready? Uh, and uh, using the technique um, painting a picture can always, always be helpful to you because you're just mirroring back to your client what you're seeing. So uh, another part of working with defenses is assessment. And, uh, you know, we, we kind of use the GAF to decide, you know, when, when it's okay to be focusing on defenses when it's not. I mean, typically when a client has a GAF below 50, you're doing a lot of self-compassion work, you're doing a lot of self-care work, for those of you who work on inpatient units, you're very familiar with that type of work. You're, you're just helping a person build up their sense of self. And so, you know, when you begin to look at someone's defenses, you really want them to be above a gap of 50 and to, you know, be able to somewhat function in their life and, and have moderate symptoms versus severe symptoms. And so, you know, one thing that I'm always thinking about is, does my client have a, a healthy relationship in their life? Because I don't want to be doing so much defense work if they don't have anyone to go home to and be able to talk about what came up in therapy and, and get some extra support. And so if somebody doesn't have a close relationship, then I might be thinking about, you know, how do I help them build up their network? 
and once they they have been able to build up their network then then we really start focused work on defenses um, that being said you know it's 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 sometimes you just have to begin the work where it is and and that has happened um, in the past for me too and you know when that happens I'm just like really um, careful with going slowly and um, being very very attuned to my client and definitely working um, in a, a collaborative way so that it's like the two of us are figuring it out together uh, you know clients who have substance abuse um, disorders and they haven't been addressing them or impulse control issues and they haven't been addressing them you know the defense work can be really really hard on them and it actually can solidify the resistance more so it's um, always important to to be focused on that self-care and self-compassion uh, and so you know when do you not focus on defenses I mean some of us have clients um, who arrive that have really great insight and a lot of strengths and they're like able to work with affect and so you don't really have to do so much defense work with them then again that type of person doesn't have a lot of um, you know strong standing um, affect phobias and uh, and so you know also you know if someone's able to kind of work with feelings on and there's not a lot of anxiety there then again you probably don't have to work on the defenses because if there's not a lot of anxiety then you're not going to see a lot of defenses and um, it, we've already mentioned when the gap is below 50 or if a client doesn't have a relationship um, or or some work uh, but you know there's always those clients that um, just find it impossible to tolerate painful feelings and whenever I come across a client like that who seems to be fairly okay they're above 50 they have relationships they do have work but they find defensive work like really really painful sometimes a red flag will go off in my mind and I'll just be wondering about trauma you know what 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 is in their past that they're just way too frightened to get close to and I see like defenses uh, sometimes coming into someone's life to, in order to like prevent them from looking at a past trauma or from re-experiencing it again. And so, you know, whenever a client's like finding it very, very painful, I, I'm just in the back of my mind saying be, be open to a trauma history emerging. And, and then I'll go into uh, working with like self-compassion and self-care and keeping in mind that that is an affect exposure and a lot of times with an affect exposure you know what happens is that um, is that you know that will trigger memories from the past and so sometimes you can work to with self-compassion next thing you know there's a memory from the past that that helps you understand why someone is so defended against the emotion of anger and uh, and so you know being flexible being able to move from defense work anxiety work to to self-compassion work really really helpful on with this part of defense work and I uh, you know self and other restructuring is a huge piece of working with defenses because you're very much in the room with your client and how you're interacting with your client really uh, has an impact on whether or not they're going to open to you and open to themselves. And uh, you know, at times, I uh, you know, it's not easy to build a therapeutic alliance. And so those would be the times that you like really work on self and other restructuring, self-compassion, self-care. And when you have a client who has strong projections toward you you want to do a lot of self and other restructuring because you want to start fleshing out those projections you know and and also finding out where the projections come from who who in their past are you stepping in for who who are they transferring emotions from their past onto you um, so here, here's an example and this is where I really miss Laura uh, being on this webinar with me because uh, she was just so helpful last week uh, but so the patient says I feel like all you want to do uh, all you want to focus on is what I do wrong you make me feel really stupid 
Now, I bet a lot of you have heard that from clients. Like it's it's they're, they're so anxious with the defense work that they they get really aggressive toward themselves and toward you. And so, you know, when that aggression comes through, you want to be paying attention to it and you have two choice points here. You could say that certainly is not what I intended to do. Can we slow down until you're feeling safe and trusting of me? Or, and this is what I tend to do more often, um, isn't that interesting? I certainly have no intention to make you feel stupid. Is there anyone in your life that has only focused on what you did wrong? And the reason why I love that intervention is I'm going right back to the triangle person because I'm really believing that this person is projecting onto me because of uh, a relationship in their past um, that has influenced them in a negative way. And so, you know, when I ask that question, is there anyone in your life who is focused on what you did wrong? You know, I might get an answer and know, you know, who, what past figure are we dealing with? Uh, so, you know, what, what do you do if your client is absolutely not ready to look at their defenses? Uh, you can, um, you know, still kind of look at the self-attacking defenses and, and, and pay attention to them, but see them more as a block to self-compassion. And you can work on building the therapeutic alliance. But more than anything, just get really, really curious. Like curious, 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 curious. Like the more curious you are, the more you're trying to understand why, the, the better off you'll do. Because there's always um, a very good reason why. It's just that your client isn't fully conscious of it. And again, you know, you want to keep Jack Pang Sepp's work in mind because if you're paying attention, if you're marrying back defenses, you're, you're actually offering them an affect exposure. It's an exposure of care and, and love. And when you do that, that might trigger a memory from the past, and voila, there's some really good information for the two of you to look at and, and, and begin to understand their defenses better. And so here's another example. And this is just something that you can use when you're working with your client. And so the therapist says, how do you think I feel toward you after hearing what you've been through and how you've had to use these defenses to protect yourself? You know, that, that's just a really beautiful way to let someone know that you're paying attention, that you care, you know, and, you know, and to also begin to test, well, you know, how, how do they see you? Like, how, how do they imagine that you're responding to them? And then at the same time, you're offering, like, really beautiful self-compassion. You're, you're letting them know that they've used these defenses to protect themselves. And, uh, and so, you know, this is, this is a great example for you to kind of keep in mind and, and to be able to use in the future. So therapist stance, I know that you're kind of figuring this out, is, is huge. I mean, because, you know, defense work is, is really an art form, and, and it depends on, like, your ability to be able to move from defenses, anxiety, to self-compassion or affect. And, and so you have to be very flexible and, uh, and, and open. But other things to keep in mind is that empathy will get you a long way. Um, you know, having like sensitivity to um, your client's discomfort, being able to see like when their anxiety comes up and noticing it and, and then being able to help them regulate their anxiety. And, uh, you know, you always want to be exploring their perception towards you, but your overall way of being is like as an ally or like a companion on discovery. And you want to like encourage a lot of participation. But there's other things to keep in mind. Like, it's important for you to be persistent. Like, like you want to get into your bloodhound part of yourself, and, and like, you, you always want to be persistent, you know, to explore. But you can't rush the process. And how you don't watch the pro uh, rush the process is by, like, really looking for those signs of anxiety that come up and being able to um, regulate them. Also, don't be afraid to be repetitive. And I know, you know, for those of you who are introverts out there and, 
you know, it's, it's much more easier to say something once. Realize when you're doing defense work, you're going to have to be more of an extrovert. <laughs> like you're going to have to say things over and over and over and over again. And so if your tendency is to say something once only, try to practice with the friend and colleague about how to be repetitive. Um, because a lot of people who tend to only want to say something once actually have a lot of shame with repetition. And so you want to be able to work through that shame that you might have so that you can repeat questions over and over and over again and not have it bring up anything personal inside of you. You just see that that's just a part of, of the job. You know, it's a part of this business of doing defense work. Um, anytime you have an example that comes up in session, you want to definitely be paying attention to that example and using it in session. And you also want to be pointing out emerging patterns um, within the therapeutic relationship. And, uh, and so really letting um, someone see like what patterns are beginning to take place between the two of you. And of course, my favorite intervention, painting a picture, just literally saying things out loud and helping them see a picture of themselves. Uh, so just so you know, for this slide, I actually pulled out David Mallon's um, book from 1976 and found it like really really helpful and so I want to encourage you to um, pick up that book because I think you'll you'll find it very helpful for defense work. Um, your own countertransference is key here so I mean what a job that you have you have to like be paying uber attention to your client and at the same time you have to be paying attention to yourself and you know we talk a lot about countertransference in our facing your fears workshop. And uh, and so you know we teach our um, therapists like how to like really work with the different feelings that come up inside of them, but for you like in terms of defense work, if you're really paying attention to your reactions and you know yourself well enough to know that you're not being triggered, you can actually use the different feelings that come up inside of you in order to like. Um, be able to ask questions or to uh, sometimes even do a self-disclosure. I've used countertransference so many times with clients and it's just been amazing to me what happens. Like if I'm able to say to someone, gee, I have no idea why, but suddenly I just started feeling really like irritable right there. And, and sometimes I do that when there's a defense in the room. And uh, I'm so curious, like, do, are you feeling defended right now? Like, do you feel connected to me or do you feel disconnected to me? That's a great question to ask. Are you in connection with me or are you in disconnection with me? Do you feel like you're sharing your true self with me right now or do you feel like you're pulling back and hiding? And self-disclosure um, can really kind of um, make things happen in a very, very good way. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that you um, also want to be putting um, therapeutic tools in the hands of your client. So you're going to um, really encourage them to work in session, between sessions, um, to do homework, and, and you're, you're hopefully going to help them get addicted to their defenses and, and being able to um, notice them. A lot of times I'll ask a client to um, you know, remember a friend who might be really good at pointing things out to them. And I might encourage them to like spend time with that friend. And for those of you who are also working on yourself, um, realize that I think this is great for therapists to do too. Like, you know, it's really hard for us to see our defenses. And, you know, I think sometimes the better we get as therapists, the better our defenses can be. So it's important to find a friend who can see you clearly and if you don't have a friend who can do that, to definitely get into therapy and um, work with um, a therapist who isn't shy about pointing out your defenses because you really need to know what it's like to have your defenses pointed out but also like how to work with your defenses. And, you know, any time that you can um, get a good therapy session or um, have like a real honest um, exchange with like a colleague and a friend about your defenses, that's a huge gift and it, it's just going to make things easier for you um, when you're working. So um, with um, anxiety regulation and defenses, it's always quite compassionate 
And you have to remember so much shame comes up to the surface when you're working with defenses. And it's really understandable that it's there. And so your job is to just kind of normalize, to make things like understandable, um, you know, to to um, just really help your um, patient kind of cultivate compassion, and like also like the desire for um, constructive action. And uh, and so you know, creating a safe and contained holding space is really important, and also being very attuned to your client. So here's a typical example: the patient says. I can't believe I acted this way all my life. How stupid. And the therapist says, it's so hard to hear you being so hard on yourself. How can you call yourself stupid when you've just realized for the first time what you've been doing to yourself? You know, and, and that's, that's your job. Like, you're there to kind of offer compassion, to, um, you know, encourage people to be more compassionate and to just help them understand that, you know, they've come into this defense for behavioral reasons. You know, they, they were trained to use this defense. And, um, you know, I'm a big believer that if someone can learn to love their defenses, then they can learn how to let them go. But if they're just attacking their defenses, it usually takes a long time for them to be able to, to let them go. So, um, you know, again, you want it to be focused on that safe and nurturing holding environment. And here's another example. The therapist says, it makes perfect sense that you would be uncomfortable having angry feelings and would become a people pleaser to avoid conflict. After all, your mother was so destructive with her anger, how could you do otherwise? But you've paid such a huge price for not letting yourself have feelings. The anger, um, you know, it, anger is is you know, to be used, to be responsible for yourself, and it can help defend yourself and set limits. And right now, that's something really hard for you to do. So, you know, practicing, like, how to say things in a nurturing, kind way is um, always very, very helpful. So now, you know, we're going to get into the um, recognition piece, and I'm beginning to realize that I... Uh, you know, perhaps um, the slides that I've pulled together, it might be too long for our webinar today, but if that happens, we'll just continue it in the next webinar in March because we'll be moving from defense recognition to defense relinquishing in March. So, um, so I think it's important for us to just take this slowly and to, like, really be able to take it in because uh, it's, it's a real art form, and it takes a while to know how to do this well. So here's a very important slide, and uh, it just this slide tells you how to do it. You know, you want to identify the defense, and you usually use a specific example in session, or a specific example in the problem being discussed, or a specific example in a relationship. You gently point out the defense. You know, there's lots of different ways to gently point out a defense. Um, Columbo is one of my favorites. Me just being like, um, you know, I don't know if you've ever noticed this before, but I just saw this. And, and you know, and doing it in a very relaxed, kind of nonchalant way can really help someone be able to take in your feedback. You want to, like, be able to explore, you know, what, what feeling they're defending against and why. So is, um, you know, intellectualization a defense against anger? You know, and, and why is that? Was it because they grew up in a highly conflicted family? You know, um, the whole time you're offering support, you're being empathetic and collaborative, you're validating the defenses, and you're recognizing your client's strengths. So here's another example. The therapist says, it's so painful to have been ignored by your parents when you said, I love you. It's no wonder you find it scary to love someone. You seem to run from closeness to protect yourself from being hurt again. What, what do you think? Did I describe what you're doing accurately? Did I miss anything? So we're going to just slow down with this example because I'm... Um, you know, we want to we want to really take it apart. So you can see as you look at the example that um, the therapist is identifying the anxiety. It's painful. An inhibitory affect is we we tend to call it anxiety. So it's painful, 
And um, they're also going to the triangle person and noting the parents, that this person was ignored by their parents. And it seems like um, they were ignored by the parents when, when the person actually activated them and said, I love you. Which, you know, I love you is a form of caring and closeness. It's also a form of anger, too. And so then the therapist says, no wonder why you find it scary to love someone. You know, if your parents aren't able to accept your love, it's got to be scary to um, love someone else. I mean, that, that's kind of like basic attachment theory up and running. Then the therapist says, you seem to run from closeness to protect yourself from being hurt again. And, and, and then, of course, they're asking for collaboration. What do you think? Did I describe what you're doing accurately? Did I miss anything? And so the triangle of person looks like this, you know. Um, and, um, and so you see in the past triangle, the past poll, the, the person's been ignored by their parents when they said, I love you. On the um, current poll, they just avoid closeness with others. And on the therapist poll, they're avoiding closeness with their therapist. You know, if you have someone like this, you want to really be paying attention to every time they do closeness with you. When they have eye contact with you, when um, they offer your hand, their hand for a handshake, um, when um, they say a joke, you know, when, whenever they're doing anything to attach to you. Because the more you can collect all the, the little moments that they do try to reach out, the, the better. Because... Someone can have like a phobia to closeness, but they could still be doing things to try and get in connection with you. And you want to be paying attention to those things because the more you gather them, the more you can refer to them and say, you know what? You, you are phobic to closeness, but it doesn't mean that you're broken to it. Like I notice every time you come in here that you always say a, a lovely joke and, and you get me to laugh. And that's a form of closeness. And so... A lot of like what you're doing is being hyper attentive to um, some of the things that they they are doing well in, in looking at those strengths. But back to the example, um, you know, this is the um, triangle of conflict, and uh, so you see um, we put under defenses that the person's running away from closeness, being self-protected and guarded. The inhibitory affects are scared, um, anxiety, shame, and emotional pain. And then the block is closeness with others. You know, but keep in mind, I wish I added this, the block could also be anger, too. Um, because remember, the story was that they would say, I love you, to their parents, and then their parents would, would push away. So um, so we, we've already gone over this, but, um, you know, defenses start in childhood. They get played out in current relationships and they get paid out in the um, therapeutic relationship. And so a lot of what you do is point out defenses, but you can also point out anxieties and feelings. And you know, you, you know that you're going to be working on the triangle of person and that you're going to be linking the triangle of conflict to the triangle of person. Um, in the beginning, it's easy to just do a few links at a time. Uh, so, but in the meanwhile, always be curious about the origin and the maintenance of the affect phobia. Where did it start from? How is it maintained? And we, we looked over this slide a little bit more in, in the last um, webinar. So here's um, David Mallon's two triangles. Thank you, David Mallon. Um, these two triangles, if there's anything that you need to learn in APT is know your triangles. These, these are like the foundation of our work. And when you're doing defense work, you're working on both triangles. So confronting defenses, again, an art form. Some of the interventions that you can do are clarification. You know, you, you're clarifying what the client did. And confrontation. You're, you're making the unconscious conscious. And so the therapist might say, when situations like this come up, you tend to talk about what you think but avoid how you feel. That's a beautiful confrontation, and it's a great way to kind of like increase your client's awareness so they can become more conscious of their defenses. Um, you know, we use interpretation. It's explanatory statements that link defenses, anxieties, and feelings with significant others. You've, you've heard this type of example a few times by now, but here's the therapist. I wonder if spending all that time at work might be a way of avoiding unbearable feelings of grief 
associated with your recent breakup with your partner. You know, beautiful, beautiful defense work there. And another intervention is core conflict uh, formulation. And again, we have past webinars that talk more fully about that. So, you know, you want to really um, keep in mind the difference between maladaptive and adaptive affect. And, you know, it seems like I'm always talking about that no matter what webinar we do. So, again, it's a very, very important piece of um, this work. And um, if you go to Treating Affect Phobia Manual, there's um, two tables. It's Table 5.1 and Table 5.2 on page 122 and 123. And um, you want to really look at those um, tables and memorize them or even, like, print them and, and have them uh, for a tool. But, you know, basically when affect's maladaptive, you know, your client's not getting any re relief. They're, they're adding more to their problems versus getting solutions. Um, they're, they're experiencing a lot of pain and hurtfulness, like a lot of punishment. Um, they may be punishing themselves or even others. There could be idealization, um, grandiosity, false happiness, uh, and some like compulsive and addictiveness. And, um, you know, with the compulsive and addictiveness, sometimes I actually see that in clients. It tends to be clients who are alcoholic. Um, but they can even bring like an addictive um, defense into sessions. They become addicted to me. They become addicted to therapy. And, and so you have to really be able to see like what's addiction and, and what's like gratitude and, um, and all of that. So um, validating defenses is a really huge piece of this work. Um, you want to go out of your way to... Um, you know, help people understand that they came up with these defenses for a good reason and that, um, you know, there, there's um, really no shame that needs to be um, uh, around the defense. If anything, they ought to feel proud of themselves. And, um, and so, you know, here's some beautiful examples to refer back to. The therapist says, of course you've reacted in these ways. What other choice did you have as a child? What would have become of you if you hadn't? Okay, that's gorgeous. Or the therapist says, it makes sense that you became withdrawn and passive when you felt angry. Your parents were not comfortable with your anger, and you so wanted to please them. Or you can say, I can see why you lash out rather than feel all this pain. In the past, you had no one to bear it with you. And, uh, you know, the, the book that I strongly, strongly, strongly recommend is The Wisdom of the Ego. And just so you know, Lee McCullough worked with George Valiant for 10 years, and that's where she learned about defenses. And, uh, and so, um, you know, this is a gorgeous book. Everyone should have it in their library. Um, so just um, real quick, and we're going to focus on identifying um, strengths. And uh, you just want to be using um, supportive statements to point out strengths at the same time you're pointing out weaknesses. That's huge. It's like you're, you want to like definitely be able to point out the positives while you point out the negatives. And all of us kind of know that. I mean, we know that our clients need to hear about what they're doing well, not just what they're not doing so well. And so here's a beautiful example. You're so good at thinking and reasoning strengths, or, or, or you're so good at thinking and reasoning, and it's helped you get through so much. But I wonder sometimes if all these thoughts can crowd out your feelings. Um, or you can say, you told me that you have trouble being close to people, but at times you've spoken with great tenderness about your friends and colleagues. So I'm noticing the time right now, and um, I was right. We're not going to be able to get through everything, but I want to um, be able to show you uh, some really important pieces um, just uh, you know, so that you have it this week while you're working. And just so you know, the rest of the... Uh, the slides are, you know, basically, um, you know, uh, cases on um, and and you know what things you need to watch out for and certain things that you can do when things are tough. And there, there's examples of that throughout the treating affect phobia manual. But you want to keep in mind that you don't push too rapidly for change. Um, you know, especially if your client's not ready. 
and that, you know, taking away defenses or at least attempting to take away defenses, I've never taken away anyone's defense unless they want it to, can be really destructive. And so you don't want to be pounding your client um, with letting go of the defense. You want to, like, kind of lead them to, to that idea. And, uh, and then you always want to keep in mind that there's got to be a replacement. If somebody is um, self-attacking, right, they, they need to have a stronger sense of self, you know, and so you really, really want to um, make sure that you're building up that sense of self as much as possible. And real quick, there's, it's very important to, like, repeat interventions over and over and over again until um, they're done. Um, and, uh, you know, when, um, when there, there's a few things to kind of let you know when a client's ready to relinquish a defense, they have insight into their behavior, they, they're disliked by the patient, um, or they've only been partially reworked and you need to do some more affect work. Um, so just um, keep in mind practice makes perfect here. You want to like do your own triangles, you want to get to know your defenses, you want to set up your own therapy session, you want to ask for feedback from your clients, and you want re, need to keep in mind that people feel seen when you see their defenses. When somebody knows this one of my defenses, I feel so good inside because they're really paying attention and they're seeing me. And so our clients feel the same, the same way, even if it does bring up shame, just if you're regulating the shame, then you can really help them actually begin to feel good about being seen so well. So at this point, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move to the questions and uh, and um, and see what people have to say. Um, so you know, thanks so much um, for for listening in on on this webinar and learning about defense work. And just keep in mind, we, our next webinar is about defense relinquishing. And so, you know, we're in process learning about defenses here. It's, it's impossible to learn everything that you need to within an hour. And, um, and, so, uh, and so let's see here. Um, oh, um, El um, Elizabeth asked if there's any special chapters or parts in Changing Character that I recommend. And uh, I wish I had the book right in front of me, but I think I put it back away. Uh, you know, if you go to the table of contents, uh, you, you'll see that there is a chapter on defenses. There's a chapter on defense recognition and a chapter on defense relinquishing. And these chapters were both used in um, the Treating Affect Phobia Manual. Um, but there, it's, there's so much more fluid in the Changing Character book. Uh, you know, and there's just so many different examples. And one thing that's beautiful about changing character is that it's very repetitive and, and, and it really helps you get a sense of the rhythm to working with defenses. It's like you're, you're recognizing them, you're regulating anxiety, you're going to self-compassion, or you're going to um, an affect exposure. And so the book really um, helps you begin to um, get a better sense of that. And um, and so you know um, you know definitely try to get changing character and, and read it. I mean it's worth it's worth the money and I think it could be really really helpful. And you know the the book that we just published on paraverbal communication that could be really helpful with defense work too because you know that book really focuses in on the nuance of the therapeutic relationship and the fact that we say a lot in our bodies. You know, we as therapists say a lot in our bodies. So if I'm sitting up in my chair and I'm moving forward and, and looking interested in my client, my client's going to register that I'm curious and I'm excited to learn from them. Um, you know, versus if I'm kind of laid back or if I'm very stiff and, and firm. And um, and so, um, oh, I... Laura, Laura Wenicus is letting us know that Chapter 4 in Changing Character is the one that has defense work. You know, I had the pleasure of going to a place in um, Amsterdam, or not Amsterdam, in the Netherlands, um, called De Versprung. And it's, uh, 
a, a residential um, hospital that uh, has integrated ISTDP into its curriculum. And the uh, staff does ISTDP 24-7, uh, and so do the clients. Um, they live, eat, and breathe ISTDP work. And when I was there, they, um, all the clients were working um, in English um, for the English speakers, and I spent a whole week there. And I uh, really developed just such a strong admiration for Case's work with defenses. And what really um, made it most special is that uh, his clients were so good seeing their defenses, and because it was a group setting, all, all of the clients were good at being able to point out defenses to one another. And, uh, and so it was just amazing to see that happen because really you know you've done good defense work. With, your client can see their defenses, but also when they're able to point out defenses too. And particularly if they can point out defenses to you because all of us have it when we're in session. And so, you know, defense work is, is about, you know, cultivating self-compassion. But it's also about assertion too. It's like, you know, helping people understand that it's important for them to have the capacity to, to um, you know, be able to point out what they see in others too, and um, and to do it in a, in a kind, um, compassionate way. So, uh, so we're really getting toward the end of our webinar today, and uh, and please, oh, it looks like oh, we have some more questions here. Um, we have, um, oh, if I could um, briefly describe types of defenses. So uh, I do know on one of our on previous webinars, um, there's a lot more um, information on identifying types of um, defenses. I think it's on um, the webinars that we've done on core conflict formulations. There's a lot written there. Um, and so, you know, I encourage you to go back to the past um, webinars, but I could also create a slide for our next webinar where I just kind of list all, all the defenses. I mean, what you have to keep in mind, and I'll say this quick because we're getting to the end, is a defense creates a wall between you and your client. It creates a wall between them and themselves. So if they're not able to be in connection with themselves or, or you because of whatever they're saying, doing, or thinking, or feeling, then, then that's a defense. 